What is up, fellow sickos? I am Dan Valley coming at you with yet another 2024-2025 NBA look ahead. We're on to the San Antonio Spurs, which means it's time to speak with Noah Magaro George. He covers the San Antonio Spurs and does an excellent job of doing so. Um, if I say so myself, at the Vic and Roll. Follow him on Twitter at n underscore Magaro. That's at n underscore m a g a r o. And follow and subscribe to the Vic and Roll on Twitter at v i c underscore. A N D underscore R O L L. I will include the links um, to the Twitter handle and uh, Noah's Substack in the podcast and YouTube description. Um, if you have not already, remember to rate, review, and subscribe to us across all platforms. Comment on these YouTube videos, like them, hit the sub button on YouTube if you haven't already. And hey, if you've done all those things, um, share it, tell people about us, friends, family members, enemies, acquaintances, the whole nine as we continue to grow. But that's enough out of me. Let's get to talking some San Antonio Spurs with Noah. Noah. Welcome back. Thank you so much for coming back on for our uh, San Antonio Spurs look ahead this season. How the heck are you doing? I'm doing great. It has been an interesting offseason for the Spurs. Maybe not what every fan hoped, but there was certainly some wheeling and dealing going on. It's not the same exact team as a season ago, and it's been a nice summer in Texas. I can't complain. I've loved it. Wouldn't you just tell me it was like 120 degrees every day in Texas? That is that considered like a nice summer still? Yeah, yeah. So we had like 10 straight days of 100 degree weather. I think last year we set the record at like 50 something in a row in San Antonio. So wow. yeah, it's a little bit better, less hot than a year ago. Somehow it's less your, hot than a year ago. Your, your heat's on is what you're saying. If you haven't had 50 <laughs> consecutive days of 100 degree weather. So you mentioned people, I guess some people not wanting more or they want more out of the Spurs offseason, excuse me. What did you make of their off season, especially against the backdrop of, I felt like I saw this more nationally than necessarily fans of the Spurs ran us of the first Spurs calling for it, but thinking that they needed to just make some <laughs> like blockbuster, like it had to be like, it wasn't, Oh, they could do this. And it might make sense. Like, no, they had to, to do this. So what did you like, what was your read on of their direction and their plans based off what they did this off season? Yeah, I was a huge fan of what they did, not to be a complete homer because I try to be as unbiased as possible, but I think they did an excellent job of really setting the tone of, okay, we want to get a little bit better. We've added Chris Paul. We've added Harrison Barnes. We've drafted Stephon Castle. These are all guys who should be in the rotation right away, right? Guys who can improve this team. You're going to have a full 48 minutes of point guard play, real point guard play every night. But then they also are flexible, right? They, they were able to trade. Uh, I think we'll talk about that later, but they, they traded the eighth pick. They stayed flexible. They added more first round picks. They have more future pick swaps. They have cash considerations that they added, whatever that does for them. So like they stayed flexible while still improving. And I think that's exactly what they have aimed to do because Brian Wright and Greg Popovich, whether directly or indirectly have said multiple times that they're not trying to just go all in right away, right away, right away. And you know, we need to win year one with Victor. That was never the goal. You know, they're never, they weren't just going to jump into this right away and make rash moves. They're looking long-term. They want to build something sustainable. And I know as much as Spurs fans and maybe even some national media members might look and go, well, you know, the Duncan era lasted 19 years and five championships. That doesn't happen overnight. It's not an accident. It has to be carefully planned. So I think that they're doing an excellent job of just trying to recreate a long-term sort of system here that's sustainable that's not just going to be oh well we have a small five-year window and now it's closed and we got to figure something out down the line no I, I think they're really building for something sustainable long term and it's interesting too because it feels like they made the, like the number eight pick trade was first of all when i heard <laughs> that i was like oh my god did minnesota like trade carl anthony towns because there was the it had san antonio trade the number eight pick without a return <laughs> uh that was interesting too because it feels like it reinforced everything you just said to where it's i don't know if the spurs i don't think the spurs got those picks with the intention of keeping those picks where it's like this is now yeah. going to be assets in the clip that maybe we don't move off of in 24 or 25 and maybe it's not till 26 or 27 but we have all these other extra picks from the hawks coming in like we are going to eventually there will be a consolidation move or there will be a swing um and we're prepping for it and so i viewed that as encouraging immediately because it wasn't it wasn't them sort of kicking the can without a plan. Like that trade yes. booed me and thinking like, okay, they, even if I, even if you didn't like who they picked at number four and Stefan Castle, we'll get to him. That trade made me think like, okay, like this is going to happen at some point. It's not going to be immediately. And I didn't think it needed to be immediately because Victor's so, so young. And so are some of the other players on this team. Yeah. Like I looked at that trade as sort of the, okay, like the Spurs are serious about this. It's going to happen. They're just sort of biding their time. 
Yeah, and I think that's exactly the way to look at things because, again, you know, there was all this talk about from especially the like big national talking heads of, oh, they got to go get Laurie Markin in, they got to go get Darius Garland, or are they going to go get Trey Young? And, and like, don't get me wrong, I think a lot of those names are really fascinating. And I definitely flirted myself with the idea of adding one of those names to the Spurs and how exciting that can be. But I think it took a lot of gall it took a lot of patience it took a lot of self-confidence and job in your own job security as brian wright as the general manager to go okay i don't have to go all in right now uh, my job's not on the line like we're building something consistently and, and and it's not just like building consistency through like the players on the team but i think also the staff right they want to have like a consistency in in mm-hmm. their plan a consistency in the players they want to have something that lasts a long time so i i applaud them for that I, i'm not saying it was a perfect off season if you ask me to grade it i certainly wouldn't say a plus they were perfect because that's not that's not true there's definitely things that could have been done better but you know i, I would say I, i'd give it an a i would give it an a I'd stand right here and tell you i think it's an a off season they were able to kind of have their cake and eat it too in a sense so i i think that they did a solid job there will be someone in the YouTube comments who's mad that you didn't give them an A plus. I just want you to. Just want you I'm to sure. That. I'm sure. Yeah. There's always <laughs> you can't please everybody. I'm you, sure. <laughs> you did touch on something, and regular <laughs> listeners of this podcast are going to be sick of me hearing this. But like you're talking, like Brian Wright accepting not just as a primary form of compensation, but like the compensation where was this pick swap and this pick that won't convey or have the ability to convey for over a half decade. I think we <laughs> or I romanticize those picks when we're talking about trades and teams that own them, but it actually does take you use the word gall. It does because it works just like there is security here and you have the latitude to, to take your time because there is that if you're going to make a trade, like and you're giving up an immediate ass, especially a top eight pick. I don't care what yeah. draft it is. And you're going to like, t- like not just again, the primary, like the compensation was this stuff that's not going to come to bear unless you move it um, for another half decade or so. I, like, I think that is encouraging because it shows they're committed to continuity and it kind of just like, remember this idea. And I don't think, it, by the way, I loved every, I advocated for them going after every name that you mentioned um, within reason. Like I would have sure, loved Larry Markin sure. on this team, but like, no, I don't want them giving up the Mikhail Bridges special at this point to get Larry yeah. Markin. <laughs> Um, but and I, I don't even remember what I was saying before that, but yeah, so it seems like they're, Oh, the narrative that was being pushed about, well, Victor wants to win so bad. They're not going to be able to wait that long. And it's just like, I thought that was ridiculous. Like they were saying that before he even took the court. And I, by they, I don't even know who I'm talking about. I heard a lot of it on ESPN, but they're just people like, yeah, he's wired different. And it's okay. He's obviously clued into this stuff. It was never going to be a problem, but I think this even underscores it's definitely not a problem. He definitely wants to win. So nobody's getting that wrong. But I think people have a misunderstanding that it needs to be right now. And Wimben Yama is not, he's not stupid, right? I mean, he, he's a very smart kid. And I think he understands and he has spoke about it throughout the season several times, which is one of the reasons that kind of frustrated me hearing that narrative of, oh, well, you know, he's going to get tired of losing and he needs to win now. Like, no, he, he did talk about, I want to win. I want to win as soon as possible. I want to win championships. But he also spoke several times, and this is the thing that I don't feel like I ever heard from any of the national talking heads, that he understands it's a process and that he, you know, quote, trusts Greg Popovich and the front office to get it done. So I don't think there's any sense of urgency that it needs to be done today. But I do believe there's a sense of urgency that we'd like to get it done sooner than later. But I still think you look at what they've done, they're making moves to get better right now, even if it's not to win a championship right now, mm-hmm. but long term, long term to have something sustainable. And and we talked about that. So I, I do believe, yes, he wants to win, but I don't think he's it's not like a situation where, oh, you know, if you don't win this year two, uh, he's gone. He's he's wanting out the door. I don't think that's a problem. And I understand Spurs fans probably have a little bit of PTSD from the Kawhi Leonard thing. We don't even have to talk about that in depth in any way, shape or form. But I think he's fine. I don't think he's going anywhere. I don't think he's so unsettled that, you know, this isn't going to be a beautiful marriage for a long time between the Spurs and Wimbenyama. And there's also, and we'll get into this later, but it's just, there's a chance that you don't just write off because you got Harrison Barnes and Chris Paul and Stefan Castle as the main attractions. Victor Wimbenyama just might be so good that the Spurs are still just like in the playoff <laughs> conversation. So it's not a loss. It, I don't even want to call it a loss. It's not necessarily a rebuilding season. Uh, but I wanted to ask you this because I dictate too much of how the order of events goes on these podcasts. What is the single biggest storyline development, whatever, that you will be monitoring with this team into next season? 
Yeah, and, and I hate to do this because I think Spurs fans are probably tired of me talking about Devin Vassell a little bit, but I really want to see, does Devin Vassell have that next little bit in the tank to make a jump to be something like a Chris Middleton to a Giannis Antetokounmpo, right? Like, does he have that in him to be that caliber of player, right? Obviously, the Spurs would have to have a lot better players around them to win a championship, but can he be the equivalent of what Chris Middleton has been for Giannis, especially when they were competing and when they ultimately ended won that 2021 title. Is that the right year? Sometimes I, you know, forget the years off the yeah. top of my head, but can he do that? Like, does he have the, you know, I guess the skill, the, the bandwidth to, to be able to make that next jump. And I think he does. I think he might, but it's yet to be seen, right? It's, it's yet to be seen, but I think he showed a lot of promising signs last season. I think he's somebody we're going to talk about, but for me, that's what I'm monitoring because I think aside from Chris Paul really benefiting when Binyama and a lot of the other shooters on this team, he's probably going to benefit, you know, Devin Vassell long-term as well. Like, I think he can learn a lot from Chris Paul. Yeah. I mean, let's talk about, you know, I love Devin Vassell. Uh, I thought he improved <laughs> incrementally basically across the board last year. And because it wasn't a monster leap in any one area, it flew under the radar. I thought the handle was better. We've talked about his defense in the past. I thought that was better. I think a part of that is Victor Wembanyama exists, so that just makes things easier on, <laughs> yeah. on everybody. Yeah. Um, and then just like, even if the efficiency was down in some areas, the level of shots that he is capable of taking and making now, like if you rewind back to his rookie season, I don't know if I ever would have predicted that he got to this point. And so I have two main questions on this, but I guess the first one is, so if he's going to make that, leap to we call it the chris middleton like status but just like oh number two guy on a contender what is it that you're looking to see him improve upon or, or develop what area most yeah i think he's got to continue to get to the rim more often like he, he upped his rim volume last season and he also significantly raised his field goal percentage inside the paint and inside the restricted area like that was huge but the volume wasn't raised that much, right? Like he was getting there a little bit more and he was way more efficient. Now, can he get there a lot more and maintain that efficiency? And then can he get to the line a little bit more? Like, can yeah. he get to the line a little bit more? Can he leverage now getting to the rim more often to create for his teammates a little bit more? Cause he did what I think he had like about three, three and a half assists per game last season. Most of those were pretty rudimentary reads. It wasn't anything you know, too advanced. It was like he was hitting guys who were, you know, a, a man away or he's hitting the roller um, with, uh, you know, a, a pocket pass occasionally. It wasn't anything that you're like, wow, this guy's really like capable of carrying an offense for a long time. It was more like, yeah, he can make the right pass when that presents itself. And, and, and I think all of those things kind of culminating together, can that happen? That's, I think that's my big question. Can that happen? Because I think that's what needs to happen for him to take that next step in his progression to becoming that all-star caliber player who can be maybe a number two to Wimbenyama. And I'm wondering if just by organically proving the spacing, because Victor Wimbenyama is better, you have Harrison Barnes, who's at least more of a threat from beyond the arc, um, if that allows him to get to the rim more. Because it feels like sometimes it does just feel like he bails out on his drives and might prefer the, the mid-range look. But other times it's just kind of like, well, you look at the way the defenses are guarding the Spurs, and that's why he gets rid of the ball. Like his, I think his pass percentage on drives was absurd last year. It was like 40% or something ridiculous like that. Um, and so I'm just wondering if the floor being more open, if that helps him get to the basket. But he has always had that element of his game where it does feel like his drives are just, you know, when he's on the ball, like it might stall out before it has to. Like he might settle before he needs to. Yeah, and I definitely think that he's limited in some way. And, and I like the Chris Middleton comparison that I threw out there. I'm not saying that's like a one for one. They're definitely not the same player. But as far as like biomechanically, they don't have a ton of wiggle, right? They don't have a ton of burst. They rely on pace, change of pace. Um, you know, a lot of their, you know, pull ups are like those one, two dribble pull ups. They're not really like east and west guys. They're mm -hmm. north south. And even in being north south, they're not truly like blow by speed, right? They're not, that's not who they are. They're going to beat you being patient. They're going to get to their spot. They're going to create space with a couple dribbles and then they're going to rise. So like, I think that's definitely a limiting factor for him. Like he's that he's never, I think going to be a better athlete than he is right now. I mean, he's not getting younger. Nobody else in the league is getting younger, right? Like, so I think that's a limiting factor for him, but I still don't think that it is such a limiting factor that he can't take another step. Like we've seen players who are not necessarily the best athletes adjust, whether it's, you know, adding a little bit of muscle to their frame, uh, you know, being a little bit more patient, using a change of pace, 
um, you know, ball fakes. Like, I just want to see, can he do that? I'm not 100% sure. I think he can. But, again, it's yet to be seen, and we'll just have to wait till next season when he's out on the court and potentially having better spacing. Could that help him? Yeah, I think it could help him. But in the same breath, I don't know that it's going to be that much better. I think it really depends on who's around him, who ends up being the starters. And how do you think his role, if at all, and I'm assuming it will, will change with Chris Paul in San Antonio now? Because I, I think the burden on him gets less. Um, and I think Chris Paul like did a better job last year of maybe getting off the ball like more quickly than we're used to. But like relative to Trey Jones, in theory, if Chris Paul's running your offense, he's a lot of times not going to get off the ball as quickly as a Trey Jones. And so what does that maybe do to... I don't want to say like necessarily his usage rate, but the type of usage we're going to see from Devin Vassell next season. Yeah, I think maybe we'll see a lot more catch and shoot opportunities for a guy like Devin Vassell. I know they gave him a lot of freedom, like a longer leash to be this guy who can create off the dribble a little bit. And so even though I said, you know, he's not really an East to West guy, they definitely let him occasionally pound the air out of the rock. I don't think we're going to see that next season so much. I think it is going to be a lot more of those. Okay catch if a guy's closing out too hard one two dribble pull up like i think we're gonna see a lot more of that out of devin vassell than like hey dev like when victor's not in the game with you we're gonna ask you to do a lot more like i don't think he's gonna be asked to do quite as much on ball creation as he was a year ago so i i'm not a hundred percent sure that's going to be a case but that certainly feels like that's what's going to end up happening especially you would have to assume chris paul's starting he already said like i'm i didn't come to san antonio to to just be a mentor and come off the bench like we know he's probably going to be starting from day one look he's already putting more pressure on them than wemby ever has and chris paul's been there for a minute. <laughs> so it turns out victor wemiyama is pretty good at basketball uh who knew uh we were very optimistic even coming off of his summer league last year but so let's start here. What stood out the most or surprised you the most or just impressed you the most about what he did? Like the single most thing that stood out to you during his rookie season? Yeah. Oh, that's such a good question because it's a hard question to answer. So I think for me, it was not really hitting a rookie wall. Like it didn't feel like he had a really long extended period in the middle of the season or towards the end of the season where it was like, oh yeah, this guy's running out of gas or, oh man, this guy needed to sit for a bunch of games because his body just wasn't used to the wear and tear. Like he... One, his body, like there were several times where it looked like he rolled his ankle and then he just like walked it off and was fine. And then basically gave credit to the, you know, phenomenal training staff that he'd been working with going back to France where his ankle flexibility has just been maximized where those sort of injuries aren't happening to guys like we saw with like Yao Ming or even like the Shaqs or Sean, you know, Bradley's of the world, guys that big. And, you know, again, Wimby's not as, as heavy as they are, but just his durability and then the ability to not sort of run into that wall, right? Like he, he, he maintained a pretty good efficiency throughout the year. And even if you look at the last 10 games of the season where he probably should have been the most tired, 26, 12 and five and a half stocks, like <laughs> with five assists per game too, like, come on, like that's pretty impressive that, he decided, oh yeah, like he didn't decide, but that he was capable of ending on such a strong note and having really memorable performances when there was really nothing to play for at that point in the season. Yeah, the thing that really stood out to me was, so they make him, they eventually make him the lone big in December or whatever. And then he just shoots like one of the most efficient off the dribble <laughs> shooters. Yeah. After that. And I was like, I didn't see you could have convinced me anything. I probably would have doubted, yeah. oh, he'll finish second in defensive player of the year voting as a rookie. I would have been skeptical, but I've been like, believed it. If you would have told me that he was going to shoot for a majority of the season, like 38% on off the dribble threes, I would have been like, yeah, okay. And he is the type of player. And I, you got this vibe, I think, with Giannis, but not as early because he wasn't playing as much, where hyperbole doesn't feel like it exists with him. Like you could tell me anything right now that Victor Wembanyama will do next <laughs> season. For his career and i'm just gonna believe you because like that's the type of player he feels like to me and now i'm just like i don't even know what like what does a victor Wembanyama with nba experience look like now like i, I just don't, i can't even fathom yeah i mean that i don't i don't know and and it does certainly feel like like michael jordan once says the ceiling is the roof like there's really no ceiling for this guy like it just feels like he's capable of doing anything the one thing i would say if we had if we, and i'm not sure if we're going to talk about this later but if I could choose anything that kind of like confused me and maybe he should he should work on a little bit was the fact that he shot like almost 38, 39% on off the dribble threes, like self-created threes versus 
like 27% on catch and shoot threes on like a really high volume too. Like I, I'm still trying to kind of work around that one. I think he's maybe a little bit more in rhythm off the dribble than he is just like off the catch. He's a little stiff off the catch, but I'd love to see him be able to maximize those catch and shoot looks because a lot of them, he was like fairly open on them. He just didn't knock them down. I wonder if it's because, I mean, not that dribbling a tennis ball being easier, but for him, it's got to be like catching a tennis ball because of his size and like trying to <laughs> like gather that and shoot it at the same time, where I guess if it's already kind of like in the palm of your hand, is it easier? Uh, I have no idea. The yeah, We all know the numbers by now, like of when he played with Trey Jones, the Spurs won oh, those yeah. minutes by like six points per 100 possessions, whatever it was. What does, and you mentioned this kind of at the top, like, what does it do for Wemby and the Spurs that there is going to be, like, even if you don't want to say a full 48, because how many minutes will Chris Paul play? Like, you have 40 minutes at least of just capable point guard play now. It's like, what does that do for him? And, like, what does that mean to this team? Oh, I think it's monumental. I, I think even for people, and for some reason, there was a really strange contingent of Spurs fans who were, like, Trey Jones haters, who they were like, oh, well, Wembenyama just... He he continued improving throughout the season, and like that's on you know he he looked that good because he was playing with Wimbenyama. No, I, I think there's a pretty strong correlation. The dad will say it, the film would say it, and I think having two capable point guards at times is massive for Wimbenyama because I think to a degree, people sort of were overblowing this. Oh, they can never find him. He's they're always missing him on lobs, but like. There is always some truth in there, right? Like, even if you're telling a joke, like, there is a truth in there. And there is the truth that, like, Spurs players missed him occasionally. Like, they missed him on lobs. They missed him in transition. They weren't quite capable of making what felt like rather elementary entry passes, whether it was, like, mm -hmm. an entry bounce pass or an entry lob. Like, it felt like a lot of times those guys were not able to do that. And with Trey Jones out there, with Chris Paul out there, and now guys who before had never played with a seven foot six guy, and now they've got a full season of that under their belt, that should improve immensely. So I think it's going to be huge for the Spurs to have that point guard play, plus the added experience and chemistry that comes with playing with Wembenyama for a year for the other younger guys. Uh, what do you make also of the turnover situation with him? Is it a product of just like learning is it i mean like he had just a lot of lost ball turnovers um i think he was fifth in lost ball turnovers he also he turned the ball over a ton in transition it was like 18 percent of the time uh, i think it's encouraging like his when he was isoing like when he would iso there wasn't too many turnovers there is it just like he's so tall that the ball has to travel such a great distance is that kind of just going to be like an inherent risk with him or do you see an ability for him to like and forget about like the bad passes and stuff like that comes with learning, I think, but just like the actual lost ball um, turnovers that came out of his handle. What do you make of those? Yeah, I mean, I, and that's an area that I'd, I'd love to see him improve in as well. But I think there's always going to be like a, a, a limited ceiling on how good of a ball handler he can become just because the ball does have to travel so far. He does have to get so low. Um, and, and even like a super wide crossover going between the legs or driving into the lane or with with guys who are digging on your drives like you know the, the ball's going to be dislodged every once in a while there it's going to be easier for guys to get to that ball it's going to be easier for guys to get under your dribble and i think that's just an inherent risk with letting him dribble the ball more and so like this may sound strange and i'm sure i'm going to catch some some flack from spurs fans but one of the things i've always said with women yama is like he's probably not a guy you want to give the ball and just say go do this, go do that. Like he's still a guy who probably in, at his best is working off of images. Their guys create to him uh, for him to a certain degree and a guy who like catches and makes quick decisions. I don't really want to see Wimby, you know, pound, like we talked about pounding the air out of the ball. Like that, that's really not something that I think is very productive. He doesn't really have the strength to turn the corner on guys. He doesn't have the handle to not have that ball dislodged when he's tacking middle. So yeah, I, I just don't think it's something that we should be worried about, but it's definitely, I think, something that's always going to happen just as a product of his size and how often he handles the ball. I do think what bodes well for him is that, and my co-host has said this a few times, his name is Grant, just saying, like, he doesn't look like someone who was shoehorned into playing basketball. He looks like a basketball player who happens to be seven foot three. Yeah. And so everything he does is so fluid that it wouldn't shock me if, like, you know, I don't expect him to be the best ball handler of all time. And look, if you're telling me, like, <laughs> I want Wemby back at the perfect angle. Like, I don't want him too low to the ground, like bending over, trying to make sure he doesn't commit turnovers. So I actually think, for me personally, the zoomed out view is like, I'm just not, not that anyone should be worried about it, but it just, 
I would expect it to like get better and better to the point where I don't, I don't even think we're talking about it as like maybe a, like if you had to pick a flaw of Victor Wembanyama, like maybe it's that. Uh, I just don't view it as something that maybe will repress his ceiling or his usage in any way. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be like a, a massive problem or anything like that. Like if, if I'm looking long term, I still think there's a lot to uncover there. Like I think he can tighten up the handle a little bit and I think he is very creative and he's also confident. But yeah. I don't think it's going to be a massive problem, but I do think it's always going to be an issue to a degree because I just don't know that you can be that tight of a ball handler at that size. Um, like, you know, for as fluid as he is, he's still like pretty stiff in the hips. Um, as far as like when you watch him make dribble moves, like he's not really, he, he gets relatively low for someone that big, but like for the average player, he's not really getting that low, you know, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah. no, certainly not an issue that I'm going like, oh man, I'm really worried about that in a couple of years. No, I, I don't think so. And I do think that there is room to improve. And I do think he will ultimately cut down on those turnovers. But mostly I think the turnovers that he could work on cutting down are just the, um, you know, bad pass turnovers, which I'm fine with him making bad passes right now. It just means that he has the confidence to try things. And I think they should give him that long leash to try things. He's a generational prospect. Like let's, let's let him see what he can do. Also, bad passes can be object. I guess if you're a fan, they can be not so much of that team, but they can be objectively fun to watch. Like just as a lead yeah. pass of wherever you come in, like <laughs> I'm team just try shit. And so I'm with you on yeah. on that one. What did you think of taking Stefan Castle and what do you make of his just overall fit with with this team? Yeah, and and I don't mean to sound too like down on the class, but I wasn't the, you know, I wasn't the biggest um supporter of this class i didn't think it was super talented so as long as they didn't reach for someone like tijan saloon or um one of the other more raw prospects in the class like as long as they were taking somebody who i thought like could potentially serve some sort of function from day one and also have some ceiling down the line like a ron holland or stefan castle or rob dillingham i was pretty much fine with whoever they took um, Stefan Castle was fifth on my big board, so it wasn't like oh, wow. they were reaching. I had mm -hmm. Rob Dillingham four. I was a really big Rob Dillingham guy, just as someone who can be a spark plug. Um, if you wanted Trey Young without, you know, trading for Trey Young, I'm not saying he is Trey Young. I'm not saying he will ever be as good as Trey Young, but certainly a guy who has the handle, can pass a little bit, can create off the dribble score from all three levels. Um, you know, who who would be really fun to watch in a woman Yama pick and roll like. Yeah, there was definitely, you know, a little bit of me that went, oh, man, I'd love to see Rob Dillingham and Stefan Castle. So, like, the trade when they traded, you know, Dillingham, immediately I was like, oh, that's a bit of a bummer, but I get it. Stefan Castle, though, not disappointed anyway. I think it's a pick that makes sense, mostly because he's a guy who, A, if they view him as a point guard, which it appears they do, all right, well, you can ease him into the role behind Trey Jones, behind um, Chris Paul. You've got two phenomenal role models there for him. He can learn a lot from both of those players. Uh, but if also the point guard thing doesn't work out, well, guess what? You've kind of got a Swiss Army Knife player who can be a secondary creator, who is a fantastic screener as a guard, a guy who's an excellent cutter, hard-nosed defender. Like, just one of those guys who can be a glue who doesn't necessarily fit into one one role, who can kind of do it all. So I think it's a phenomenal pick for the Spurs just because it's hard for them to lose in any scenario. Now, I do think there's a chance that he's probably not as good as Spurs fans make him out to be right now. He may struggle a little bit as a rookie, but that's pretty normal. Like most players struggle as a rookie. So if he struggles a bit, I'm not going to be shocked. Yeah, I was torn on the pick. I felt way better about it after they signed Chris Paul. That's just, oh, like uh, Stephon Castle is just going to be learning under Chris Paul. I think the thing, and I harp on this too much with prospects, I like, what do you make of, like, do you see anything or evidence that, oh, the jumper will get better? Just because, like, he struggled on on making threes, even wasn't too efficient on catch and shoot threes, I think, while he was at UConn. And so that's something that's, like, the, the malleability defensively, that guy will defend wings and he will do it well. Yeah. So that's great for this team to have. Um, but I'm just curious as to what he becomes as like a like a floor spacer as an actual shooter. Yeah, he gives me some concerns in the same vein that I'm concerned with Jeremy Sohan, where guys are legitimately fine to just like leave him out there and go, all right, shoot. Like they're daring him to shoot. They dared him to shoot at UConn. Uh, there were a lot of times where teams dared him to shoot at UConn and then he still didn't shoot and just passed it up. One of the things I liked at summer league was like, okay, if you're going to leave me open, I'm going to shoot. If you're going to go under a screen, I'm going to pull up off the dribble, which are things we didn't really see at UConn playing for a championship contender 
at mm. UConn and the team that ultimately ended win ended up winning the championship. Yeah, they were never going to just like let him do those things at UConn. Like he had to fit a role at UConn. So like we weren't going to see those things. But it was nice to see him have the confidence to pull up off the dribble from three, to pull up off the dribble from mid-range, to try to create for himself a bit. But I think ultimately, even if you look at Summer League, which is pretty small sample size to be fair to him, uh, the three-point percentage wasn't good. The free throw percentage wasn't good. The mid-range jumper percentage wasn't good. Like, I don't think he's going to be a guy who comes in next season and says, oh, wow, he's a lot better shooter than we thought. I No, I don't think so. I don't think he's a particularly good shooter right now. And at least... You know, since Chip England left this team a couple of years ago, I don't know that we've seen any like major evidence that anybody who's joined the Spurs as a non shooter has suddenly become a shooter. I think they've definitely made pro uh, progress with Jeremy Sohan and not to um, insult him too much here, but like you started from a really, really low bar. So even if you started from that low bar, you were always going to make some sort of progress. Like he was not always going to be like a 17% three point shooter. Right. Like that wasn't, you know, like he, th there was nowhere to go, but up. So I'm hoping that we see progress from other guys who've been on this team that can kind of say, Hey, you know, Jimmy Barron, who's the new shooting coach there since, um, you know, uh, England left town. Like he, he's making real progress and he's having an impact on these guys. And hopefully that can continue to Stefan castle. But for now, I don't think we've really seen that. And that's, you know, again, that's no shade towards Jimmy Barron. It takes a while with these sort of things, but it definitely makes me wonder, like, wh what is he going to look like in a couple of years? And is that something that will really improve? Yeah. And also just off rip, he feels like one of the, and you said you clearly dug deeper into the draft than I did. It feels like he was one of the prospects that had the wider variance in like comps where it's, I saw him compared to everyone from, Bruce Brown to RJ <laughs> Barrett. I saw some Shea Gilgis Alexander light stuff out there. And I'm like, those are all just like very different players. Yeah. Uh, I think it's all over the place. And like we talked about that, you know, if at his peak and it all works out as a point guard, I think it's because he's able to, at the very least have found a mid range game and that he's shown that his handle is tight enough and he's got that sort of grasp of change of pace and able to snake pick and rolls and make live drivel passes um, you know, whether that's like a skip to the corner or a pocket pass to the big who's rolling to the basket. Like we saw that at Summer League. He looked really good as a point guard, as a facilitator in small spurts there. But in that same breath, if he never is able to shoot and guys in the NBA are like, I'm going under every screen, I'm going to leave you open every time. Um, is there a world where he's no longer like you can't really roll him out there as a point guard and he more becomes sort of this Lonzo Ball player who... Uh, is more of a connector piece than a guy who brings the ball up the court every single time. Could he just be a connector who, you know, is a great cutter, who um, is a phenomenal defender on the other side of the ball? Sure. Like, I think that's also a fantastic outcome, but I think there's a wide range of outcomes for him that really depend on where he gets to as a jump shooter. And what type of role would you expect him to have? Like, is this someone that they're going to give like serious floor time to, if not out of the gate, like as the season goes on? I expect him to play from day one. I, I think he's going to okay. be a guy who's coming off the bench, you know, 15, 20 minutes, like kind of the same way that I saw Devin Vassell, where people were like, oh, every player who's come through San Antonio went to the G League and they don't see any action as a rookie. And when the Spurs drafted Devin Vassell, I told people, I was like, he's probably not going to spend a lot of time in the G League. I think he's ready to play a small NBA role, even if it's like 15 to 20 ish minutes a night. And I see Stefan Castle in the same sort of like mold as a, as a Devin Vassell, as a guy who has some NBA ready skills, who will probably be shifted a little bit off ball so that he's not running an offense and he's more of just a connector. He's eased into a role. I think that that makes sense. And, and like, I, I hate to say that it's probably going to come at the expense of guys like Blake Wesley or Malachi Branham, but you know, it's year three for them. And I don't think either of them really showed enough that you go oh yeah you get minutes year three like no you're gonna have to beat out stefan castle in training camp for those minutes and just as it stands right now i think stefan castle's a better defender than they are i think he's a better processor than they are and i think he's a guy who just in general is got these intangibles that lend themselves towards winning whereas malachi branham blake wesley they're still very much like developmental projects who haven't really proven anything in any substantive way for a team that has lost you know 60 plus games back-to-back -back seasons it's hard to trust in them so it turns out jeremy sohan isn't a point guard uh that's valuable no. information to have 
What do you sort of, he does other stuff though, like the paint pressure and rim pressure, I think especially within the offensive ecosystem that the Spurs have, like some of the stuff he does, it is very good. But what do you kind of see? And we know what he can do defensively now, or like we have the bones of what this player can look like on defense. What is like the, you're looking at this team, like what do you view as his role and fit? And like, what is your goal for Jeremy Sohan leading into year three? I do not know. I wish I had a really solid answer for you. And I think Spurs fans will still be upset at me for this, but I don't know that I could look you in the eye and tell you like, oh, I promise you Jeremy Sohan will be like a really important part of this team in three, four years. Like we've already, they just drafted another guy who can't shoot the ball. Um, Trey Jones can't really shoot the ball that well. Zach Collins can't really shoot the ball that well. Keldon Johnson is incredibly erratic as a shooter. Julian Champagne is also incredibly erratic as a shooter. Blake Wesley can't shoot the ball. Mal Malachi Branham is another guy who's very erratic as a shooter. Uh, Devin Vassell is probably their best shooter on the team right now with Harrison Barnes. So, like, I, I see him as one of those guys that, like, I love him, and I think he could be really good down the line, but... What does he do for you as a floor spacer if there's other guys who can't space the floor? Like, how do you fit him into there? And I think a lot of his defense, he has some really nice moments. I would still categorize him more as an agitator than a lockdown defender. Like, his numbers are fine defensively. Like, his defensive field goal percentage is okay. I think he takes on a lot of hard ass uh, assignments because there was nobody else to do so. Right. I think he did a really good job against bigger wings, against guys who are a little bit stronger, maybe not like the most bursty athletes he had a really good um a uh, couple of showings against guys like Kawhi Leonard against guys like Devin Booker against someone like LeBron James but against smaller shiftier guards against faster guys he wasn't particularly good he's not quite big enough to guard centers or bigger forwards um I don't you know we talked about he's not a point guard I I don't really right. see him in that and and people I think a lot of Spurs fans want to compare him to Draymond Green Draymond Green is an all-time processor. He's an all-time playmaker as a short roll passer, as a guy who can be a dribble handoff hub. Jeremy Sohan hasn't shown that. He he can make a good pass every once in a while, but in the same sort of breath that we talked about Devin Vassell, where he's mostly a guy who's making passes from a man away, that's how I see Jeremy Sohan. So I don't really know how he fits in here long-term. I think his best bet to being here long, I know the Spurs organization loves him and fans love him, I think he's got to he's got to become a league average shooter as a catch and shoot guy because he's not a guy who's going to be a pull up scorer. He's not pulling up from three. He's not pulling up from mid range. His field goal percentage on drives was abysmal. He shot forty nine percent on drives last season. Uh, he was in the lower percentage uh, as a guy who passes out of drives. Like his assist percentage out of drives was really low. A lot of his drives stall out because he's so stiff and he doesn't have the wiggle off the to create an advantage for any. So it's a driving, I'm cut off, I'm kicking it out. But his kickouts aren't advantage creating. They're just resetting the offense. It's going back to square one. So I don't know. I wish I had better things to say about Jeremy Sohan. But for me, at least, the verdict is still out on whether he's really like a long-term starter on this team or what. what is he exactly long-term, especially with Stephon Castle in the picture. If Stephon Castle doesn't end up being a point guard, you got two guys who are like, pretty similar as far as like being a Swiss army knife kind of player. But I think Stefan Castle is a better processor. I think he's a better passer. I think he's a more versatile defender. So I hate to say all that stuff about Jeremy Sohan because I think he's an all time competitor. I think his, his motor runs super hot. I don't think you'll find, okay. you know, two or three players who have a higher motor than Jeremy Sohan. But you know, if I were to ask you right now, what does he do really, really, really well? I don't know that there's a lot of things you could list off for me. At least anybody who's been watching the Spurs this last couple of seasons. I'd be super intrigued as to how much more valuable his defense becomes with Stefan Castle in the picture, but those are also two players as of right now that you probably can't play together a ton of minutes. They because they can't shoot. Yeah. yeah. And I, I would be interested to see like more of, you mentioned Draymond Green. I don't see that in Jeremy Sohan either, but to give him like more of those touches, like coming out of screens and trying to get him going downhill that way, does that change anything? But like even you mentioned like that doesn't, he's not necessarily going to have that burst. Like Draymond Green has like those, those like hot feet, sometimes and you don't see that as much from jeremy sohan but it be it might be worth a shot if you're looking for a long-term role on this team yeah and i think one of the things that I, I try not to like be too critical because it has been like a developmental sort of last couple of years but i think one of the things that has been sort of a disservice to jeremy sohan is that they haven't used him really at all in any meaningful capacity as a short roll passer like as a role man he's not really like setting screens and then rolling to the basket i think 
I would have loved to see him gain those opportunities when the men didn't matter. Uh, and, and now the minutes are starting to matter more. So you can't just, all right, like Sohan, let's let's figure out if you're a good short roll passer now. Let's like let's make you a playmaking hub. It's kind of hard to you now you've got other guys like Chris Paul's gonna want his touches. Devin Vassell's important to the team. Wimbenyama's integral to the team. Chris Paul's again, like Chris Paul's probably gonna be the guy who has the ball in his hands the most. All right, Stefan yeah. Castle, we want to see what you can do, but we don't want to throw you in the G League, probably. All right, well, who's gonna get those opportunities? Who's gonna be able to have the ball in their hand? We know he's not a point guard. I just I have questions about Sohan. I don't have questions about his character. I don't have questions about his motor. I don't have questions about his work ethic. I just have questions about developmentally, where does he go from here that makes him a fit long term? That's that's my only question. Speaking of players we've had questions about and their fit long term, Keldon Johnson's still on this team. Honestly impressive when you just consider. Yeah. I think... When we were talking last year, I probably would have guessed that Kelvin Johnson wouldn't have been on this team by this time this season. But so what do you like? What are, what do you view? Is he <laughs> closer to like the ideal role now that they've kind of expanded their depth a little bit? Or just like, what is the hope or expectation for him on, uh, on this Spurs roster? I will say, even though I think Kelvin Johnson is a guy who I could potentially see them getting something for and maybe moving off of, I think he's had the hardest job of anybody on the Spurs, oh, I'll give him three seasons because it's just constantly changed from being like that, that primary scorer before women Yama got here to being like the third guy with DeJounte and DeMar to now coming off the bench last year with women Yama and having De Devin Vassell take more touches to, okay, we want you to run some pick and roll at the beginning of seasons and really see what we can get out of you there to now you're mostly off ball to like, he's just done so many things and he hasn't had a consistent role or a consistent place in the rotation that I feel like he's been almost given the short end of the stick. I would like to see him just have a consistent role off the bench. Your number one guy, as far as like go to score off the bench. I just, I just want to see him have some consistency. Cause although I don't think he's a particularly good defender, he's got heavy feet and he's not like the biggest, quickest guy. And I don't think he's the most consistent shooter. I think he's been put in a tough position. I think consistency for him would go a long way to helping him Build consistency on the court, if that makes sense. So I just see him have something that he can hang on to for an entire season, and we go, okay, that's what he is. I, I don't think we've really gotten that from him yet, and, and he hasn't been afforded that opportunity yet, I don't think. I am. I do find him maybe more, I don't know if the word is valuable or interesting, on the current iteration of the Spurs, where I do think even with Castle and Sohan, it feels easier to because if Victor Wembanyama is going to shoot like he did, and maybe improve his catch and shoot percentage. It's easier to open up the floor, and so you have those sort of bull in a china shop drives from Keldon Johnson. Maybe take on more meaning if he's reacting quickly off the catch, and maybe does his own three point percentage go up because of how much better point guard play there is across forty eight minutes? Because he's also just like anecdotally, he feels like first team all shoots worse than you think he does from three point range. <laughs> Where if you go back and look, it's like oh, he hasn't shot even thirty five percent each of the passes and he was below 33 percent not last season but the season before yeah and and you always i always walk away thinking like oh yeah keldon johnson's a good shooter but then i have to remind myself like well you're right like the percentages haven't been very good like any of the last three seasons but i also think you know the team has been bad the context has been bad i try to give the benefit of the doubt to these guys and like I know I come off as a Keldon Johnson hater sometimes, and I'm not. I, I have the utmost respect for him. He's another one of those guys who high effort, high character, great work ethic, always in the gym, great part of the community. Like, I, I just, he, again, I'd, I'd love to see him have a role, have better players around him so that things are more defined for him and he can just go out there and know what to expect and what's expected of him every single night. Uh, and until we get that, I don't want to pass too hard of a judgment on him, but... I would love him to just be able to knock down the three ball, attack closeouts. I think simplifying his role is the best thing that they can do for him. I don't want necessarily want to see him with the ball in his hands. I don't need to see him running pick and rolls. I don't even necessarily want to see him have any secondary creation opportunities. Just simplify the role, get to the basket off of closeouts, shoot the three ball if you're open, run hard in transition, and like you know, defend your ass off if you can, because he's not a great defender, but he puts the effort in. Like, I, I, it's not that he's not trying. He just, I don't know that he's, he has the physical tools to get it done. He's, uh, 
he's super malleable on defense to where it's like you can throw him in a bunch of different situations, but it's just like it never like that versatility just never like lines up to this massive impact where it's, it, sometimes we conflate versatility with impact, but I think the versatility is important. And so that, I mean, like they have a bunch of interesting defenders on this team. Now there could be lineups where he's like their fourth most important defender. And that's like a really good spot to have Keldon Johnson in probably. Probably. I also would say I don't think Keldon Johnson's – I would actually probably go as far to say he's a pretty bad defender. Like, he ball watcher, late on rotations, doesn't always communicate. Like, heavy feet, on ball. Like, he's too heavy to be guarding guards, but he's also too small to guard forwards. Like, he's in a really tough spot that if you watch him every night, you're like, man, he does a couple of things every night that are like year three, year four, year five. You really probably shouldn't be doing those things anymore. Like, you, you're – a leader you've been here you know what's expected of you at least defensively i haven't seen a lot of improvement defensively from him they certainly use him as though he is versatile he gets to match up against guards he sometimes matches up against forwards sometimes he's on uh, ball handling wings but rarely do i walk away from a game going man he was really effective like that that dude did something tonight most of the time it's like ah that was rough. Uh, that was tough. And occasionally there's like one or two flashes throughout the night where you're like, mm, high effort play. I love that. I love seeing he put in the extra effort. He was on the floor. You know, like, I, I love that. But I'd love to see him be impactful. Like, I, And I don't feel like he's an impactful defender. I don't think the numbers say that either. You mentioned CP3 before said he's not here to mentor anyone. Uh, what I find interesting is, so you look at the number he signed for, it's less than the non-taxpayer mid-level, which means in theory, if he were to be bought out or waived, he could sign with anybody <laughs> that he wants. Do you view this as some sort of like tacit agreement that if the Spurs are out of the, the, the plan running by the time the trade deadline rolls around, that they would look at moving him or maybe he would broker a buyout later on? Or do you view this as like CP3 can say whatever he wants, but like this was very much like he came here, eyes wide open. This is to play with Wemby. And he will be to some degree like a, a mentor here. I think so. And like I just want to want to clarify. He said he wasn't here to just be a mentor. Like he he's here to be a mentor to these players, but he didn't just sign up for a mentor role. Like he fully intends to start. He wants to play in every game. He wants to play heavy minutes. Like he didn't come here just to be a mentor. Um, and so I do think like a lot of that is one. He also talked about wanting to prove in the press conference, wanting to prove that he's still a starter and a high level you know player in this league. And I just have a hard time seeing anybody, even no matter how well things realistically go for the Spurs, then looking at Chris Paul and going, yep, this is a guy who can be a starter for the next two, three years. It, I, I still think people will view him as this is sort of Wills for Wimbenyama and he did a good job or he did an okay job. I just don't see a reality in which a team is at the buyout market if the Spurs do buy him out or like, yeah, this guy's a starter. I think the Spurs are his best avenue to being a starter like he wants to be and playing heavy minutes like he supposedly wants here. So I, I, it, it could happen. I think it could also happen with a guy like Harrison Barnes. Um, but I, I think more than likely they're probably on this team for the long haul unless it really goes south and they just want to be sellers and get whatever they can for those guys. I want to talk to you about some of the tertiary players on this roster that you've already kind of mentioned just to hear your updated thoughts on their game, their roles. Uh, let's start with... Uh, Malachi Branham, RIP to that push shot percentage from the, the previous year. It, it dipped a little bit last year, but yeah. so where are you at with him? <laughs> I don't know what to make of Malachi Branham's future in San Antonio just because it doesn't seem like San Antonio is all that invested in him being here long term. I think it's been the same mistakes you know, low effort defensively, making the same mistakes defensively. He's still passing on three pointers when he's shooting threes. It's not at a high percentage. That push shot went way down as you're talking about like the floaters, the runners, like the percentage on those are way, way, way down. He's okay as like a secondary ball handler who can handle a little bit of creation responsibilities, but like there's really nothing that sets him a apart from any of the other young guys that makes you go, yeah, he needs to be here. Or he should be here. Or he should be given extra opportunities. Like I just look at him as, okay, well, like this is probably like do or die for him this season. If he's not good again, like no, not to be rude to him, but like if he's not good again for a third straight season, it's probably it. Like, I don't think San Antonio is going to be, you know, itching to get him back here for another season or make him a long-term part of their, you know, puzzle around Wimbenyama. Uh, Blake Wesley. Blake Wesley, I do think a little bit differently. He is a guy who 
drastically improved his rim finishing percentages last season. That was one of the biggest deals for him heading into the NBA. At Notre Dame, he was awful around the rim. His rookie season, he was awful around the rim. He's cut down on the turnovers. He has increased his assist percentage. His three-point percentage was a lot better in the G League. He didn't shoot very well in the NBA last season, but you can start to see like some semblance of a catch and shoot three where like in the G League last year he shot almost 40 percent on more than four attempts per game in the G League and it was like 20 games so it was like a decent sample size just wasn't quite shooting at that level in the NBA I don't know if it was confidence maybe he didn't have the green light to shoot but I definitely think that there's the outline of a player who can be a guy who comes off the bench and is and just a pest at the point of attack like this dude he was giving fits to Lamelo Ball. He was bothering Trey Young. He was forcing, you know, eight second eight second violations uh, coming out of the backcourt. Like he's a guy who'll defend you the full ninety four feet. Like, yeah, I think there's a chance that if he can make these small improvements this year, just become like a decent catch and shoot guy, someone who can make less and less mistakes off of off of his drives and create for other guys. Like th that's a guy who can be in your rotation. So I do have a lot more hope for Blake Wesley. But I will say, I think his hopes have been dashed a little bit by adding someone like, you know, Stefan Castle with the fourth pick, just because that's a much bigger investment than putting minutes into a guy who you took 25th, I think. And, and, and I think that makes more sense for the Spurs to invest in Stefan Castle in that way. Uh, CD Sissoko, who is uh, probably going to replace Dominic Barlow as like my my Spurs, like pet, like pet. Oh, I love this guy project. I know. And, and. Good luck to Dominic Barlow, man. I, I hated to see him go, but I think he's going to have some decent opportunities in Atlanta. City Sissoko, another one of those guys that, man, if he could shoot, man, we're talking about a different player. But again, another one of those guys, can't shoot, a lot of turnovers. Definitely has this sort of like new age Boris Diaw sort of feel to him. Really creative passer, uh, a, a guy who gets downhill, big body, about 6'8" runs in transition, tries to dunk everything, which is very much unlike Boris Four. Diaw, who was pretty yeah. much glued to the ground. But you see it in the defensive vers versatility. You see it in the like the creativity and the, and the passing flashes from him in the half court as a connector. Like I think he is a guy who, again, if he can learn to be a decent standstill shooter, and I think uh, shooting is really a big swing skill for so many of these guys on this roster, he may have a spot. But I think until he can shoot even at a respectable clip. I'll even give him 32-33% from three on a couple of attempts per game. Teams will be willing to leave him open, and I don't think the Spurs can afford to shrink the floor. And I don't think they can afford to rework their rotations in a way where he's not playing with other guys who can't shoot the ball. There's just so many of them right now who either can't shoot or they're erratic shooting, and that I just don't know that you can really squeeze him in the rotation. But I love what I saw from him at the end of this last season. Like, so fun. And and Popovich had a lot of great things to say about him at Summer League. So we'll see. Maybe he ends up surprising everybody. Maybe he has a great, you know, uh, uh, training camp and, he, and he's in the rotation. I would love nothing more than to see him in there because he's a lot of fun. I promise I'm not forgetting about Mamu to anyone who's listening. But the big man <laughs> rotation beyond Wembenyama fascinates me a little bit. When you're looking at the secondary minutes, do you think that they're going to default? Like, is it just we have to default to Zach Collins because we paid him? Or is there a chance for them to experiment get weird and would you expect him to even try that or again are we just defaulting to like no zach collins is going to soak up those minutes yeah i think it's probably going to be a default zach collins, I, they're paying him a lot of money at the very least if he can prove that he's better than he was a year ago maybe he needed more time to recover from you know he's constantly a guy who's constantly injured maybe they can recoup some value from him at the trade deadline or something like that but i think unless he's truly horrific the, you're probably going to see a lot of Zach Collins. Now, I, I would say Charles Bassey and, and Mamu, if they do move on from Collins or they decide, okay, we've seen enough of Collins, it's not working out, I would probably lean towards Mamu. I, I'm a big Mamu fan. He's another guy, really creative passer, can handle the ball at almost seven feet tall. In theory, another guy who can shoot but is very erratic shooting, good cutter, runs hard in transition. Not a great defender, but really interesting numbers next to Wimbenyama. Last season, I think they only played like 127 minutes, so take it with a grain of salt, but they had about 11 net rating together when they were on the court, like a positive 11 net rating. So they were a fun combination to see him kind of slide to the five, and Wimbenyama got to play the four for some minutes, and then you had like Mamu as the playmaking hub and Wimby was occasionally coming off a of dribble handoffs or uh, high-low actions like it, it was a lot of fun to see them play together so if I had to like throw 
a guy out there that I do want to see play with Wimbenyama a little bit more next season. It's definitely Mamu. I mean, I, I, I really like him. But again, you know, can, can he shoot consistently? Can he knock it down at a respectable rate? Yet to be seen. They're a team that they've replaced the Thunder as my favorite theoretical, like, let's just take a flyer on Robert Williams III as our backup big. Um, because I still think he's not going to space the floor. I know you're talking about floor spacing, so I'm not talking about playing him next to Wembenyama necessarily, but his passing out of roles, um, the stuff that he can do defensively, like you talk about being able to hang on the perimeter. Even when he, he gets injured, comes back, and they're just able to do all the same stuff. It's just, can he yeah. be healthy? Um, so I would like to see them, because I'm not a Zach Collins guy anymore. I kind of used to be like the theory of him, but I was kind of <laughs> like, right, it's not happening. Yeah. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, so I would like to see them make, that's a weird, that's a dumbass thing to focus on. I know it, but I'm like, I don't <laughs> want to see them get weird with their own roster at that, those big man minutes, whether you want to call it beside Wemby or just like the secondary minutes behind him. I want to see them either upgrade them or just get weird with them. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, as much as this is not like a hundred percent a rebuilding year and it's definitely a year where they want to be a little bit more competitive. I still think you have the leeway to be a little bit experimental. Like not working out with Zach Collins, and Zach Collins still isn't knocking down the three ball, and Zach Collins is still getting eaten alive in the pick and roll, though I will say to a degree, not 100% his fault. Like Guards have to be a little bit better coming off of screens, not getting stuck on screens. But if he is truly a disaster and you don't feel like it's going well, try something else. That's I'm, I'm fine with that. Try something else because you've got a lot of guys who are at the very least like fringe NBA players who are just waiting for that opportunity to maybe prove that they do belong at the end of a rotation. Guys like Bassey, guys like Mamu, guys like City Sissoko. Uh, you know, I'd love to see them get minutes uh, and, and get weird with lineups. Maybe you play lineups that are, you know, maybe they're s small ball lineups, but they're still bigger than what you would think. Like City is not a center, but like he's a big guy who can handle the ball. Like just get, get creative if things aren't working out. And I, I think that's kind of what I liked at the end of last season is that we saw lineups with like City and Mamu and Wimbenyama and you also had Blake Wesley out there. Like it was just, they were that weird lineups. Unhinged. That but is unhinged. They I love still it. were like, well, we're going to try it. Or like Devontae Graham was out there too alongside Trey Jones. It's like, yeah, never in, in your wildest dream would you really expect the Spurs to be rolling out two really small guards next to each other. But they were like, hey, you know, it's the end of the season. Let's do it. Like, yeah, I'm fine with them getting weird because at the very least, it'll be entertaining and maybe you learn something along the way. Are you ready for the cookie cutter portion of these podcasts? Absolutely. Let's start positive. Is there like an underrated strength that's just flying under the radar about this team, in your opinion? Yeah, I want to say it's probably their defensive versatility. I think you look at guys like Wimbenyama, Vassell, even, you know, Keldon in theory is versatile. Jeremy Sohan, Trey Jones, Champagny, Castle, Barnes. I mean, we could, you know, we could continue listing things. Sissoko, uh, uh, Bassey to a degree, though he's mostly just like a traditional drop coverage big. Like, I think their defensive versatility in theory could be really fun. And I think that could be something that they could really hang their hat on. Because offensively, we talked about, well, you know, the spacing is probably still going to be an issue. But defensively, with Wimbenyama in year two, adding a guy like Stefan Castle who... You know, can guard wings, can guard guards. Um, having Sohan, having a guy like Champagny too. Like you could have a lot of different defensive lineups that, in theory, are really hard to break through. Like the, you, the, even if you were like forcing them to switch, doesn't matter. All these guys are switchable. Like I think the more underrated parts of this roster. Now, whether those guys end up playing together, we'll see. But I think there could be a lot of switchability on this roster. It'd be really funny if they're just trying to like preserve Victor Wembanyama's defensive player of the year case. So they're literally trying to make sure that they're because <laughs> there's like anecdotally people want their defensive player of the year to come from a team that's like top 10 or better defensively. And so it's, we're just going to roll out these lineups aren't going to do shit offensively, but to the point in the season, we're just going to make sure that we keep our defensive yeah. rating good enough to, to get Wemby his his one of his many DPOIs that just feel inevitable at this point. And I'm not going to lie to you. I kind of expect, and maybe it's too much for me to expect this, but I kind of expect him to win defensive player of the year in year two. Like, I don't think you go anywhere but up from here and you finish second as a rookie. Even though the team was not very good, I think you still could have made a very real case for him being defensive player of the year last year. So I think with improvements, it's going to be hard to, I think, stop Wimbenyama from winning defensive player of the year in year two, which is an insane thing for me to be saying, even as I'm thinking about saying it's it not right though. That's again, Wemby has just absolutely nuked the concept of hyperbole. And I think he will. I mean, th this roster, I, I agree with you that it could be better than expected defensively than maybe what people might be penciling them in for. Um, but if they're not, Victor Wembanyama, I think, will be prepared to test the whole 
Like, can we finally <laughs> get into like, why is Wemby responsible for the minutes that he's not on the floor? Like when we try and nutshell all these arguments, like a lot of people don't want to talk about the on off stuff. And it's, well, if they yeah. were like in the 80th percentile defensively with him on the court last season or whatever, it ended up being super high. Like that should matter. Like, why is it his fault? What's happening when he's not on the floor? So that might be, he might be the player that forces us to have, take a longer look at that, that process is what's, if you're looking at this roster right now, what is your like biggest need or concern for it? Yeah, I mean, I think we've talked about it ad nauseum a bit, but the shooting, it really is just... With the caveat, the where if this guy with, could shoot, he'd be excellent. <laughs> exactly. I mean, and even, like, to a degree, like, Wimbenyama, awesome as a, as a pull-up three-point shooter off the dribble, but, like, you know, the, the catch-and-shoot numbers were pretty abysmal last year. Does he improve in that facet? Does Keldon Johnson become a better shooter? Does Sohan become a better shooter? Does Trey Jones finally become a league-average shooter? Does Zach Collins come back to this guy who we thought could at least be a, a, a stretch big is Julian Champagne, a guy who shoots more consistently. Can Stefan castle shoot? I, you know, there's a few guys on this roster who I look at and I go, you can shoot. That's Devin Vassell. That's Harrison Barnes. And I think to a degree, maybe Julian Champagne. everyone I else. I have very yeah. serious yeah. questions about including Mamu, including Wesley, including, you know, Branham and Sissoko. Like it just, the list to me goes on and on about like, can they shoot? And if they can't, what does this look like? Because it didn't look great last year when they couldn't shoot. And if they can't shoot again this year, because it is largely the same roster that they had last year you know, with a few additions, what does it look like? Uh, so that's my biggest concern is the spacing. Um, what is the concern with Julian Champagne shooting from you that you've mentioned it just a couple of times? I was just because he shot like, what was it like 36% from the corners or whatever it was. And that's incredibly left. erratic. He had okay. stretches where he would shoot like 56% for like 12 games. And you'd be like, Oh my God, like this guy, he can't miss. And some of these are like hand in the face, no breathing room. And he's still knocking it down. And he's knocking down like three, four in a game. And you're like, okay, it's been like four straight games and this guy can't miss. And then it'll be like 10 games where he's like one of 16 from three. And you're like, okay, well, when he's not making a three, what does he do? Like, he's not great at finishing at the rim. He, he's not great at attacking closeouts. He doesn't create for anyone else. He's not the most timely cutter or like instinctual cutter. He's not effective in transition. He's just a guy who can hit passes from one man away. So like, if he's not knocking down threes, what does he do? So that's the concern for me with his three ball. It's like, the, the defense, I, I really think he's a great defender. I think he's a really, a much better defender than a lot of people probably even realize. But if you're a 3 and D guy, but like the three part of your 3 and D is only there 50% of the time, 40% of the time, you're basically Andre Roberson. And I don't, not to, Whoa. you know, not to throw oh, shade to Andre God. Roberson, but you're not, <laughs> you're not really doing much out there at that point. Um, so. Oh, I was not expecting, I was not expecting <laughs> that. From talking to you, if you're looking at, and I know the rotation might be different, but at full strength, if they had to play 10 guys from talking to you, it sounds like there are nine locks. And so you could correct me if I'm wrong on any of these, Chris Paul, Devin Vassell, Jeremy Sohan, Harrison Barnes, Victor Wembanyama, Trey Jones, Zach Collins, Keldon Johnson, and Stefan Castle. Would you? Yeah, I think that's fairly accurate. I would probably add Julian Champigny in there because he was mostly a starter last year. And whether we want to argue it was out of necessity, I think Pop really loved, and he talked about it throughout last season, one of the reasons that Julian Champigny is in there, low usage guy, catch and shoot guy, a little bit of a movement shooter, understands his role, he's not going to ever try to do too much. Like he's never going to dribble the ball too much, he's not going to make a bad pass, he's not a guy who is going to make mistakes defensively. So if I had to add like one more guy in there, it's probably Julian Champigny. I think he's probably got minutes until someone else from him. Um, but, you know, Pop you is a guy like who... A break. Sorry. Down. No, go go for it. I was, if you had to pick like a breakthrough candidate of the, like to come in and party crash that top ten list of the players that we didn't mention, who would you? Is it Blake Wesley? You seem to be pretty. Impressed I think with it him. might be. Yeah, it might be Blake Wesley. I think Blake Wesley has a good chance to do that. And for as not high, as low as I can be on Malachi Branham, sometimes I think he has a decent chance. Like when I watch him out there, the, the defense is not something I think is ever going to be like a, a calling card for him, but if he can be someone who knocks down that floater at a good clip, 
can get back to knocking down the mid-range jumper at a good clip and then can just knock down those catch-and-shoot threes like we saw at Ohio, at Ohio State. Like at Ohio State, this was a guy who was shooting 40-plus percent on catch-and-shoot threes on about three or four attempts a night. Like if he can mm. get back to that, that's a useful player in a rotation. That's a guy who's useful regardless of how ineffective he can be defensively. That's still someone who has a spot in a rotation at the end of a rotation. But, if, you know, again, if he can't shoot, then, you know, well... <laughs> then, he, then he's not that useful. But definitely I would say if someone broke in, it would probably be Blake Wesley. Uh, th and that's who I would be betting on to break into the rotation if there was somebody. This is to some extent matchup dependent, but if you had to pick right now what ends up being their most leaned upon crunch time unit, who would you go with? Probably mostly their starting lineup. So Chris Paul, Devin Vassell, Harrison Barnes, Jeremy Sohan, Victor Wimbanyama. I think at times, depending on what you need, like if you need a three, if you're, you know, whatever, uh, maybe substitute Sohan for Keldon or Barnes for Keldon. Maybe Keldon's having a hot night and you have to have him in there, whereas Harrison, maybe he's not having such a hot night and maybe Harrison slows down a bit defensively because we have seen in the last couple of years, like Harrison Barnes is a fantastic player as far as like a role player goes, but He's been slowing down a bit year after year the last couple of years. So I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, Keldon Johnson ends up breaking into that, you know, closing lineup, so to speak. Yeah, the Harrison Barnes experience for Kings fans last year has them excited about DeMar DeRozan's defense, which I think goes <laughs> eight or nine Yo. bridges too far. Um, but I understand their point, how frustrating <laughs> he is. Is there a funky, weird, offbeat lineup you would like to see them try this season? Doesn't have to be realistic. The less realistic, the better in my book. Sure. Yeah. Well, if we're going crazy, then let's say Blake Wesley, Stefan Castle, City Sissoko, Jeremy Sohan, and Victor Wimbanyama. You got a ton of defensive versatility. You got guys who can handle the ball. You got guys who can pass the ball. Fortunately, you got a, guy, a lot of guys who can't shoot, but maybe they learn how to shoot miraculously. They're all shooting well, and like you've, you're working with you know fire. Um, that's that's a weird lineup. I'd love to see. That would be. At least Wemby entertaining. Is the I don't think shooter. that's a lineup. <laughs> yeah, a weird lineup, not that effective. But if we're going weird, I mean, that, I think that's about as weird as you can get with the Spurs. I don't think mine is too weird by my own standards. But I was trying to figure out a way how to get to four out around Steph Castle, and so I Steph Castle Wemby so locks. I think Harrison Barnes has to be in there. Then Devin Vassell, and I was kind of struggling between. Keldon Johnson or my actual pick is just going to be Julian Champagny because as you know from last year, I have a soft spot for him. So that would be like, can we get the four out around anything four out with Steph Castle and then Wemby on the court? And I count Wemby as an out now. Like he's part of any four out model. You can't, yeah. you shoot that. I know the catch and shoot percentages weren't great, but like, I, I don't want to talk about what we talked about earlier, but just the pull up three point percentages. I never would have in a zillion years guessed that he would have been as good at those as he was last year. No, and that was like even even having seen him with you know Mets ninety two knock down a couple of ridiculous shots. It felt like those shots that we saw were like really the highlights. But if you were watching, he didn't really knock down most of those pull up threes. And then last year it was like the opposite. There were a lot of pull up threes that he the made. volume was like like it yeah. was real, like it was real volume. That's was yeah. the other thing that was staggering. Yeah, insane, just ridiculous, unthinkable. Didn't would never have predicted that in a million years. Even for him, I wouldn't have predicted yeah. that. I will now just not push back on any prediction for Wemby. You t tell me whatever you want about <laughs> Wemby. I'll just, I'll believe it. As we record this, their win total is set at 36 and a half. Are you taking the, would you take the over under on that? We'll start there. I'm probably leaning towards taking the over on that, but I could understand the other side of the coin. The only reason I would be taking the over is because I think. I, I am banking on internal development. I am banking on Victor Wimbanyama being a lot better this season. I think Devin Vassell will be much improved. I think the addition of Harrison Barnes and Chris Paul will do wonders for spacing, for consistent creation. And I think shifting guys back to the bench like Keldon Johnson, like Trey Jones, maybe even Julian Champagny, it, it really reinforces their depth. And so I think they could have a good chance to, you know, it's probably not a, a winning record, but, you know, 36, 37, 38 wins. I don't think that's out of the question. The only problem I have with that is the West is so, so, so deep. And shout out to the Grizzlies, by the way. I, I don't know that people are really giving them a ton of credit. I think they're going to be a monster in the West again. And that's a saying something considering how deep the West was last year and really is routinely year after year. 
I think what benefits, I mean, like the West is hellaciously deep, but like the Grizzlies are going to be back up and now the Clippers are going to suck. So that will like maybe even things out a little bit. But um, I think uh, we haven't done our over-unders yet, but I think the only way they probably won't hit the over is, and you can use the injury caveat, but you don't get to use it with Wemby after he played in 71 games as a rookie. Like you don't get to, everything is well if they're healthy. Like that's just implied. Um, unless they decide to lean into it, like an out of it at some point in the season, because yeah. the numbers with Devin Vassell, Trey Jones, and Wemby on the court last year were incredible. And now you're scaling that to better. We talked about this already, better point guard play. And as you said, internal development, specifically from what already might be like, he was on, he was on the fringes of the all NBA discussion last year, like as a rookie, that's fucking crazy. Yeah. Um, how many teams though, would you be confident to say right now that, okay, they will be better than them in the West? There's, I think, Portland for sure. And then I'm like, it starts to get interesting after that, where I think it'll be Utah. Like, I think that they're not going to be, even though they, re, like, extended Lowry. But, like, after that, it gets, I think you could tell me, like, you could tell me the Spurs finished, like, 7th, 8th, and I'll believe you. But, like, you could also just tell me that the Spurs finished 12th, 13th, and I'd probably also believe you because of the structure of the Western Conference. Yeah, and that's what I struggle with. Because I looked at the teams in the West, and, Really outside of Portland, Utah, maybe the Clippers too. I don't know that there's a lot of teams that they're just outright better than. Like just off the top of my head, thinking about the moves that other teams made. You know, like the Nuggets are definitely better. The Lakers are definitely better. Uh, you know, the Suns to me are, you know, definitely better. The T Timberwolves are still better. The Mavericks are still better. Uh, you could argue maybe the Warriors. Maybe the Warriors have a bit of a, a, a drop off, a precipitous drop off after you know, the exit of Clay Thompson, and it kind of feels like things are coming to an end for them. But even then, they still have Steph Curry. They still have Draymond Green. They still have Kaminga, who looked phenomenal, I thought, at the end of last season and could maybe have a real breakout season. So, like, really, I think those three teams that we talked about, the Clippers, the, the, the Blazers, and the Jazz, probably are the only ones just off the top of my head. But I'm sure I could be forgetting someone. But it feels like it's going to be another of a year in the Western Conference. Noah, is there anything or anyone I didn't ask you about that you think we need to discuss before I let you out of here? Yeah, just real quick. I, shout out to Harrison Barnes. I, I don't think people are giving him really the credit he deserves. Like He's a guy who he didn't have to waive his uh, trade kicker. He waived his trade kicker. It allowed the Spurs to bring back Julian Champagny. It allowed them to bring back uh, uh, Charles Bassey. And then I think people probably have forgotten about Harrison Barnes' legacy as a player because he maybe isn't a superstar who, you know, is going to go to the Hall of Fame. But you know, McDonald's All-American, top recruit in his class, a guy who's won an NBA championship, played for Roy Williams, has been, uh, you know, a lottery pick, has been to the playoffs several years, has been in the league for, you know, 14, 15 years. Adding someone like that to be a mentor and show guys like Wimben Yama the day-to-day -day grind of you know how to handle yourself as a professional on and off the court, uh, tips and tricks of the game, uh, you know what it takes to be a winner at the highest level. Like I, I think obviously Chris Paul we knew was going to bring that sort of aura to the team, but having a leader like that and someone who can set an example for the Spurs, I think Harrison Barnes probably is going to be bigger for them in that capacity. Even if he is good on the court, I think in that capacity probably bigger than people realize. So just wanted to give him a shout out there because I think he deserves his flowers in that, in that regard. Noah, this was great. As always, are you just able to tell our listeners where they can find you and all the great work that you do? Absolutely. Yeah. First off, thank you so much for having me. And yeah, you can find me on Twitter or X, whatever you call it now uh, at N underscore Magaro, M-A-G-A-R-O. You can find all of my writing, my podcast, my video breakdowns over on Substack. It is called the Vic and Roll, Vic dash and dash roll. And then lastly, you can find my YouTube videos over on YouTube. Just search my name, Noah Magaro George, or look up Spurs. I'm sure you'll find me there too. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for having me. Always enjoy talking basketball with you. Always enjoy talking about Spurs basketball. So thank you again for having me. Oh, of course. And thank you so much for all your time. I will talk to you soon.